Good evening. Rama, my voice is okay. Beautiful as 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 usual. <laughs> okay. Let us start. So uh, this we today uh, in the morning we uh, we were doing this uh, pre previous exam, and this is MRCPCH clinical Jeddah Jeddah exam in uh, 15th of March 2016. Uh, so three four years back. Okay, so first question was uh, two week old who referred with skin lesion, and uh, we discussed it is as uh, benign pustular melanosis or uh, SSSS or impetigo. Okay, there was pustule, so we can say impetigo or uh, benign pustular melanosis. Uh, now, next is Young girl with puffy face and lower limb edema. Just one minute. Doctor Tamana, excuse me. Hello. Yes, just hello. Good evening. Yes, the why not epidermal bullosa, this pastules? Yes, pastule can be epidermolysis bullosa. Yes. Anything yes. more? Sir, yes. Yes, any more epidermolysis losa simplex. Yes, can be. Hmm. But just I've yeah. done in addition to this melanosis and this epidermal. Yes. So as far as age is concerned, so it goes more in favor of this epidermal bullosa. It yes. could be. Hmm. Yes, it could be very good. Yes, this is another epidermolysis bullosa, but simplex type. Yeah, they they can uh, epidermolysis bullosa simplex can also present like this. Yes. Anything more? Okay, now next child. It is a young girl who uh, puffy face, lower limb edema, stable vital signs, and capillary refill was less than two seconds. Uh, video shows positive shifting dullness. What is the diagnosis? I mean, nephrotic syndrome, definitely. Positive shifting dullness. Capillary refill time important in nephrotic syndrome because. Uh, this is uh, two second means the child is not in shock. So we no need to give fluid bolus or something like that. Now, young boy with unsteady gait and cerebellar ataxia, what investigation you will do? That is viral serology and CSF isolation. Same question. Uh, if we see that last 10 years, video sections are almost similar. If you see almost similar. Uh, like cerebellar ataxia, this is coming every time with uh, herpes joster or uh, like chicken pox, this is coming every time. So if there is any rash and we see there is unsteady gait, then this is due to, mainly due to herpes cerebellitis, cerebellar ataxia. Another is, we, uh, there is a common question, facial rash with, with a, a nerve palsy, facial nerve palsy. So that is also a common uh, question. And we know that from many virus that can cause like Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, herpes virus, okay, many virus they can cause, and Lyme disease, Borel virus can cause uh, this kind of facial nerve palsy. This is from morning we know. Now, uh, so in cerebellar ataxia, what investigation we will do? Uh, CT scan, I don't think CT scan is important here. We can do CSF study. There may be viral isolation organism, but uh, do you think viral isolation is possible in cerebellar post chicken pox, post varicella uh, cerebellitis? There will be no virus in the cerebellum, in the CSF. I think this is like autoimmune process, this cerebellitis. Anyone have any idea why in uh, chicken pox, there is cerebellar involvement, especially for cerebellum. Why? Is it uh, like autoimmune cerebellitis or something? Because I know that in CSF study, we will not find anything from uh, cerebellitis. What is the CSF finding? Anyone having any idea? Just that this is actually cerebellar finding, CSF finding. 
I think there should be nothing in the CSF because this is post cerebellar ataxia because the infection has already gone. Mm. Uh, um, so there is definitely nothing. I had one patient uh, from uh, very far lung area. I was treating him, presented with uh, acute ataxia. Uh, I could not find anything. Uh, in fact, I did everything. I did uh, CSF everything for her, but there was no history of chicken pox before. So I did MRI, and they gave me uh, the findings of uh, post cerebellar viral infection uh, only on the basis of abnormal signals in the cerebellum. Yes. So this so is what we can. Shall we do CT scan then? I I yes. don't know because for post varicella cerebellar at uh, cerebellitis nothing to do only clinical. Yes. Only clinical diagnosis. Yes, I also think so. Let us check acute cerebellitis in varicella. Post chicken pox neurological sequelae. Is there anything we need to see investigation? Mm. Acute cerebella cerebellitis in varicella. Let us see. This is UK website. They said if you want in the CSF, if you want to find the. Uh, hmm? uh, one second. Hmm. Viral load in the CSF is too low. Even if you will do uh, that uh, lumbar puncture, you will not find anything. Sometimes they can do PCR, right? Okay, so actually we will not find anything. That is also our learning. Yes, just one minute. I'm sharing, guys. My network actually having some trouble. I hope my voice is audible now. Yes. Yes. Okay. My network actually giving some trouble. Okay, so this is uh, here in this space. Okay, so if this case come in exam, how you will answer? Like, um, this is they are saying that this child is. Uh, chicken pox and post cerebellitis chicken pox. So if any investigation will say that um, investigation is uh, like clinical diagnosis and treatment is supportive. There is no role of steroid, I think. The supportive treatment. Uh, Dr. Tamanna, which number you are uh, doing now? Uh, Scenario number? The page number 10. Uh, this one, three. 
Three, okay, young boy. There is a viral serology and CSF isolation of the organism. Okay, so uh, uh, we can do PCR also because I saw in the internet there is PCR. We can do PCR also and lumbar puncture and CSF study, CSF PCR. Okay, viral serology. We can. Uh, do Dr. Tamanna, what uh, what I know is that if it is acute, acute, mm -hmm. if there is no history of varicella. In that case, yes, you have to do everything because the uh, other viruses like Epstein-Barr virus, like the uh, mycoplasma or mums or the other viruses, they are very notorious. They, they, they are very severe. In that case, you need to do uh, MRI, you need to do CSF, you need to do culture and PCR, everything. And you will get at least something on that. But uh, in the other case, if you do uh, uh, CSF, you will not get anything except mild lymphocytosis and only mild uh, raising of the proteins that's yes it. yes virus active viral particle uh, we uh, we will not uh, get i think active virus or viral particle yes you are right okay then next and management what management do we give uh, steroid here Okay. No, steroid. I there is no steroid. steroid uh, I, I have given uh, methylprednisolone, and there is in the literature. Yes, you can give methylprednisolone, uh, mm -hmm. but to a very resistant case in which there is prolonged uh, signs or worsening condition. Uh, in that case, you can give literature. It is there. Methylprednisolone, short course, two to three days. Okay. Okay. Two to three days. Okay. Okay then. So this uh, this much also I also know this much, but this is a very common case. Okay, so we should go through these good books like uh, NHS website. There are patient info. We can go go into patient info and we can go into like um, NHS website, any website, good website or Nelson for this post cerebellitis. Okay, we should read details because this is coming frequently. Okay, now next, going to the next three-year-old girl uh, who has fever for three weeks, not responding to one week, course of amoxicillin. And hemoglobin is 11.2, WBC 16,000, platelet 6,35,000 with high ESR and CRP. And uh, video shows hand, small joints, swelling and redness. So what is the treatment? So what is this child actually? Fever for three weeks, not responding to one week course of amoxicillin. What is this case actually? And uh, there is a video shows a hand of small joint stiffness, redness. So this is GIA because GIA will not resolve with antibiotic until you, unless you give NSAID and uh, like this. First line is NSAID, then disease modifying drug, DMARD. Okay. So I think this is GIA, three years old. And if it is rash, associated with rash, then the diagnosis is SOGIA. If fever with rash, with organomegaly, with lymph node, then the diagnosis is actually SOGIA, systemic onset GIA. Okay, so this is a case of, I think, GIA because there is thrombocytosis also, thrombocytosis. Okay, now next. Next is five year old. Next question number five, three-year-old boy with 12-hour history of cough and difficult breathing. Uh, yeah. Dr. Taman, uh, sorry to interrupt you. This mm -hmm. one, um, why JIA? Because it is not fulfilling the criteria of JIA. It can be simple arth reactive arthritis or it, it can be uh, uh, some other arthritis, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're but right. not yeah, yeah, because six criteria, six. yeah, six week. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Three weeks, sorry, yes. I did not notice it, three week, yeah. But I noticed the high ESR, high CRP, high platelet, and the child is not responding to amoxicillin. If it is septic arthritis, then it must be a, a, yes. a, some response. Yeah, yeah, septic arthritis, exactly. And in septic arthritis, we don't give NSAID. Money we give as a supportive, but we mainstay of treatment is aspiration. So here they say mainstay of treatment is NSAID. So I thought it is maybe GIA. Yeah. 
Yes, but at least it is not uh, JIA because uh, three weeks is not sufficient. Okay, so how? Uh, sorry, you... must you have three weeks if if you're thinking um, systemic onset? If you're thinking okay. soldier, must it be uh, six weeks? Yes, I think it's every GIA six week, every GIA. But soldier, yeah. soldier, no, 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 no. I I'm think soldier sure. is not the six weeks is um, so doesn't really much. apply for soldier. Yeah, and soldier. I think that's kind of it's mm -hmm. fever for more than two weeks and joint involvement for more than six weeks. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are right. Uh, is it fever but, for fever for more than two weeks and joint involvement is more than six weeks? Here the fever is for three weeks, but joint involvement, yeah. we don't but know the duration. For, for duration, it is written six week, uh, six weeks. Six weeks, yeah. Yeah, but in yeah. Sojia, see, Sojia is presented like, you know, leukemia. I remember like this, soji and leukemia, they are the differential diagnosis. So if you see a child of soji and if you wait for six weeks, he or she will deteriorate. Uh, okay. No, uh, this is soji is a systemic onset, GIA? Yeah, soji means systemic onset. Yeah. yeah, so according to definition of that, I think you, this guy, I didn't see his name. He's absolutely right. This is soji, yeah. Because yeah. two weeks, the cutoff value is two weeks for a systemic concert GIA. Yes. It's not six weeks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, yeah, it's fever for two weeks and uh, joint involvement first. Okay. So this is a case, clear cut case of Soji, I think, because the treatment is NSAID. They are saying treatment is NSAID. Now, next case. Okay. So uh, we have to read Soji also. Soji is also a very common exam scenario. Now, next. Next is a uh, three, uh, three years old boy with 12 hour history of cough and cold and difficulty in breathing. Video shows barking cough, strider with no respiratory distress. So this is um, group or laryngotracheobronchitis. Organism is parainfluenza, right? Hemophilus parainfluenza. Okay, and the treatment is mild to moderate. We don't give uh, oxygen. In severe cases, we give oxygen. And uh, in severe cases, we give adrenaline nebulization, but in mild to moderate, we give oral dexamethasone. In severe cases, we actually stabilize the child by adrenaline nebulization, then we give uh, oral dexamethasone. There is no IV, there is no role of IV, except the child is uh, in severe dehydration or se severe cyanosis, then we will intubate. Any child uh, who has respiratory distress with cyanosis, definitely we will try to intubate. Okay, so this is group. Mild to moderate treatment is almost same, but severe treatment is a little bit different. But there is no IV drugs. This is important. There is no IV drug. Next. 11-year-old girl who brought to the ER by her stepfather and with history of multiple bruises, normal CBC and coagulation profile. Video shows well girl with multiple bruises is in arms and legs. What next investigation? Answer includes skeletal survey, bone marrow, other long list of investigation, and none of the above. So what is this? Multiple bruise, normal CBC coagulation. So this is non-accidental injury, right? Uh, non-accidental injury because uh, in the answer, there was skeletal survey and bone marrow. Why bone marrow? I don't know. Bone marrow, we don't do bone marrow in non-accidental. Why bone marrow? Because everything was normal. Coagulation profile was normal. CBC was normal. There is no indication of bone marrow here. Maybe it's for the differential diagnosis. Differential so if you're considering diagnosis. the differential for multiple bruises, leukemia, you have to also keep that in mind. Probably how about come why. How come the CBC is normal? Well, if CBC is normal, we can't justify doing bone marrow. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's we true. Yeah, but, but the age, the age is not a typical age for, for, for Yeah, yeah, physical, for, no, but you know, the non physical, physical abuse yeah. can be at any age. It is not like True. 11 yeah. years, he cannot have physical abuse. He can have. Mm. Mm. Dr. Taman, a coagulation profile includes what? 
फ्रैक्चर any bruise bruise anywhere in the body it may be small child it may be large child any any child okay next <coughs> next is 14 year old whose video is record of auscultation with systolic murmur radiate to the neck so this is typically aortic stenosis see this aortic stenosis comes many time frequently so aortic stenosis video is very important okay here the child will present as shock collapse or uh, you know faintness tiredness this is sign symptom and uh, in this, uh, on examination we will find ejection systolic murmur on the second right second intercostal space which radiating to the right side of the neck carotid artery and what is the characteristic of the murmur in aortic stenosis ejection systolic and we read today aortic regurgitation that is the third intercostal space rough rumbling and early diastolic murmur and we will find water hammer pulse in aortic regurgitation okay but in aortic stenosis we will find features of shock like very thin pulse uh, sometimes pulse is not palpable even what are the expected complication as we said faintness okay and cardiac dysrhythmia and then shock and then sudden cardiac death these are the expected complication Monumental. i think the, the most mm -hmm. important thing is uh, presence of uh, suprasternal thrill okay uh, because if you find uh, if you uh, if they ask you in investigation uh, one of my supervisor um, he was mrcpch and he had uh, uh, he was presented with a cardiac case and they ask him to auscultate the precardium and he mm -hmm. straight away put his hand in the suprasternal region and he found there is a thrill so he just laughed to the examiner do you want me to proceed more and also the examiner laughed and he said okay what's your diagnosis he said aortic stenosis and that's all station finished hello yeah yes yes audible yeah audible okay i don't know my net is going and coming like this today i don't know what happened okay so uh, dr tahir is right yes suprasternal uh, thrill is very pulp, very much uh, common and complication we know and examination finding is also we discussed okay another video is common video that, that is aortic regurgitation that is also very common video ओके इलामा प्लीज इन बिटवीन म्यूट एवरी वन ओके आई
If I mute everyone, you will be muted also. I cannot do it that way. I have to search who is that. Okay, I will unmute, no problem. Okay, okay now, next is eight. Eight-year-old girl with casual breathing. So casual breathing, which investigation first? This we discussed a lot in the morning. Sugar, RBS. Yes, then second is ABG. Yes. Third is gas, blood gas. Blood gas, second, okay. And now next is baby with respiratory distress uh, on oxygen via nasal cannula. Video shows micrognathia and cleft palate. What is next investigation? Option include nasopharyngeal airway, intubation and ventilation, nasal CPAP. So this is which case? Nasal cannula, respiratory distress. Video shows micrognathia. Ah, Pierre Robin syndrome. Pierre Robinson. Yeah, Pierre Robin sequence. So what is the investigation we do for Pierre Robin syndrome? We do nothing. We give, uh, ah, which type of ventilation you give? Very important because they have cleft palate. You cannot give nasal CPAP. Every every AR you give by nasal CPAP, it will go into abdomen. So there will be abdominal distension. Nasal intubation. Yes, you have to give nasal intubation. Yes, and ventilation. Yeah, yeah. Nasopharyngeal airway. What is that? But the child is in respiratory distress. Yeah. Okay. So you have to give something. Now, what is the option? Nasopharyngeal airway or intubation? Which one? Uh, you will start with CPAP. If it's not in, in improving, then you will shift to... No, no. CPAP you cannot give. Nasal CPAP. CPAP. Nasal. No, you cannot give because there is cleft palate. You cannot give nasal CPAP because the child, every every year you give by nasal CPAP, it will go directly Doctor, to the... Dr. Tamanna, you know, it's uh, from clinical practice. Definitely, you will give nasopharyngeal airway. This is the answer yeah. because the tongue, it's a micrognathia, so the tongue will act as a macroglossia because small mouth and the tongue will be like this. So it will obstruct the airway. So in uh, BLS and uh, Paul's, the first thing is secure the airway. Hmm. So it is nasopharyngeal airway. You are, you are right. And in this child, remember that nasal CPAP is contraindication. Why? Because you will give nasally to the forceful air and this forceful air go into go into mouth because there is a connection so nasal CPAP is totally contraindicated here right okay so there, there is another exam uh, the FEMA DK girl newborn birth from ours policy okay we discussed treatment newborn preterm multiple progressive lesion in the scalp eyelid and abdomen so this is hemangioma. Treatment is oral propanolol. But we have to remember if there is multiple hemangioma on the any site, we have to do CT scan. Because and if in the body there are more than five more hemangioma, than five. we have to give ultrasound of the liver because uh, there is hepatic involvement. Mm -hmm. But in the eyelid, you have to refer to the ophthalmologist. In the scalp. If there is a progressive large hemangioma, you have to do CT scan because there may be intracranial extension. Okay. And definitely in this child where there is multiple hemangioma in multiple parts of the body, you have to refer many, many specialists like ophthalmologist, like if there is liver involvement, hepatologist, if there is scalp involvement, neurologist. Okay. And diagnosis is hemangioma, multiple hemangioma, and treatment is oral propanolol. Oral propanolol, we can start as a pediatrician, but not like as a uh, specialist, we, we have to refer. Next is preterm baby, distress admitted for poor feeding, brother having upper respiratory infection, no hepatomegaly. Excuse me, can I interrupt just... Uh, I have yeah. heard that if we start on oral propanolol on newborn, we have to monitor the uh, baby Cardiac. for development of hypoglycemia. Propanolol, there is a side effect of hypoglycemia. Yeah, possibly. yeah. So main yeah, thing is that yeah, yeah it causes yeah, hypoglycemia. You have to monitor. Yeah, possible. we should monitor for hypoglycemia. That's another important thing we should remember. Yes. Another is cardiac status. You have to monitor the ECG. E e e ECG because that they, there is bradycardia. No? Propanolol usually does what? That's why patients should be admitted is. first don't should be given in a hospital. Yes. Also hypertension. Uh, hypertension. Hypertension. Hypoglycemia, hypertension. Yes, these are the side effects. Yes, very good. 
Okay, so there is some chat. Nasopharyngeal airway, first airway distress is mostly because tongue falls back and obstructive, okay. Guide the airway, okay. Then hypoglycemia, hypotension, first dose to be given in hospital, okay. Yes, very good. Next. Next child is preterm baby distress admitted for poor feeding, brother having RPI, so this is bronchiolitis. And there is no hepatomegaly, no systolic murmur. Okay, no hepatomegaly means it is not in failure. And systolic murmur may be due to preterm uh, PDA or maybe due to um, maybe due to uh, systolic murmur is a innocent murmur maybe. Now nephrotic girl, anasarca, ascites, effusion, lower limb, edema, capillary field time four. This we discussed right? Nephrotic syndrome we discussed. So this is common. Repeat question. Okay, we discussed in the morning. Here, bolas. Uh, so, sorry, Dr. Tamana, sorry to interrupt you uh, because sometimes you people are going too fast. <laughs> I get stuck. Uh, this, the last one you discussed, can't it be myocarditis? Which one? Bronchiolitis? The bronchiolitis. Although there is no hepatomegaly, but it's not necessary. Brother is having UTI, so there is a history. Of yeah, this is, yeah, this is a history, na? upper RTI. That means brother is affected with some virus also. So, so the myocarditis is always viral. Yeah, but this is not like uh, so much. He is a preterm. There is a risk factor, preterm. So it will go with the bronchiolitis, I think. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Preterm. Okay, okay, okay. Got it. Yeah. And we, thought, we should think of common uh, diagnosis first, probably. Yeah, common things first. Viral myocarditis is very rare, no, Dr. Tahi, very rare. It is how many child we see viral myocarditis, but every day we see 10 child of bronchiolitis. So common is common. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. If you say now virus myocarditis in the exam hall, examiner will know, you know, like he will frown first. First of all, he will frown to you. Who is that guy? Let me see him on <laughs> the video. <laughs> Let me no, but, uh, but Dr. Tamanna, if you remove this preterm word, I think myocarditis is very common. It's very, very and common. I, you you cannot I, say that this is not common. But if, if compared with bronchiolitis, yes, it is uncommon. No, I, 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 I did not see many cases, actually. I see many bronchiolitis every day. I am a consultant, so I am the owner of this area. This area, I... Viral myocarditis, I saw hardly one or two cases, hardly, because not so common. That is myocarditis by Coxsackie virus. And Coxsackie virus is, you know, Coxsackie A and Coxsackie B. Coxsackie B causes viral myocarditis. Coxsackie A causes hand, foot, mouth disease. And I saw every day one or two hand, foot, mouth disease every day in my OPD. But viral myocarditis, trust me, I saw hardly two cases in 2020. Hardly two cases, they presented with failure or something like chest pain. I did, uh, you know, ECG, echo like this. So viral myocarditis is not so common than the bronchiolitis. And Coxsackie A and B, among these two virus, Coxsackie A is more common than the Coxsackie B. Okay, so Alhamdulillah, because the rare things are not so common. I mean, the bad thing are not so common. This is good. Okay, so this is, we actually will say, we actually will say like this first is bronchiolitis. They have given many history like brother has RTI, preterm baby, in distress. There is no hepatomegaly. Okay, so they have given us many clue that this is bronchiolitis. Okay, so we'll say first. Uh, we'll practice like common things first. And very good. You are very good that you say it as differential diagnosis. Yes, very good. Now next is uh, cases of periorbital cellulitis, number six. I choose IV antibiotic. Today we discussed if the periorbital cellulitis is uncommon presentation, high grade fever, the child is toxic look, and if it is bilateral, and if it is uh, extensive, spreading rapidly, then if there is any uncertainty, go for IV because we don't, we can't take chance. Normal child, they are talking, there is no fever, child is oh, healthy looking, then we can start oral amoxiclav, but. Preferably, we should start ceftriaxone or cefotaxime plus clindamycin plus metronidazole according to our guideline, Red Book. Okay, clindamycin to neutralize the toxin. Now, next. Next. Boy, new onset abnormal gait. Okay, so there is a boy in the video. New onset abnormal gait looked like unilateral high stepping gait. Best investigation is actually nerve conduction study. We discussed today because, because the patient uh, is basically, it is a diagnosis of 
common peroneal nerve injury. So we will do nerve conduction study, not MRI. Because we discussed it is high stepping, uh, high stepping gait, it is uh, unilateral. So unilateral, uh, usually common peroneal nerve injury. Foot drop. Yeah, foot drop, very good, foot drop. Yeah, high stepping gait by foot drop. And as we discussed, it is not hemiplegia. Why? Because in hemiplegia, usually this, this is not high stepping gait. The patient actually reverse. High stepping gait and hemiplegic gait, they are totally reverse. Child don't move the leg on the ground. This is the main criteria for hemiplegic gait. The child has circumduction, uh, half of the circle, circumduction gait. And this is staggering gait, you know, the child cannot foot up the foot from the ground because there is a stiffness of the muscle. So new onset abnormal gait looked like unilateral high stepping gait. Best investigation is nerve conduction study. Okay, this is not hemiplegic gait, okay? Now Down syndrome child, clubbing, cyanosis, pansystolic murmur. What is the diagnosis? Uh, this is a cyanostic child. Why not this is uh, ABSD? Uh, why pulmonary hypertension first? Why not this is ABSD with Essin Menger? There is pansystolic murmur, so AVSD is most common. Pulmonary hypertension, we will not find pansystolic murmur, okay? This yeah, we'll get a loud P2. We won't get the pansystolic murmur. Yes, loud P2. This is the pulmonary hypertension murmur, Eisenmenger murmur, but not pansystolic murmur. Yes, you are right. So anyone, any input about this case, Down syndrome with clubbing, with cyanosis, with pansystolic murmur, what it can be? I think it can be Eisenmenger. You are right. Can be BSD also. Why Eisenmenger? There is pansystolic murmur. Why Eisenmenger? Pansystolic murmur, there is a loud because, P2. Because child is with pansystolic murmur and now develop uh, clubbing with cyanosis. So it is a complication that also develop uh, this pulmonary hypertension and Eisenmenger develop in this child. That's why the child is cyanosed with clubbing. As you a complication know, of that is disappearance of the murmur when the child develops pulmonary hypertension. But it's not only the manna that they have AVSD only, the Down syndrome. They have also VSD and they have also ASD sometimes. They're not only coming with AS, uh, AVSD. Pulmonary all. hypertension, pansystolic murmur will disappear. There will be shunned. Yeah, you don't know the, the scenario full, no? You don't know the scenario full. Maybe he's not uh, uh, surgery, post-surgical. Maybe he had VSD, he developed uh, this Eisenmenger syndrome. I don't know. Okay. Case. No, no, I, I, I just, I just uh, try to say that pansystolic murmur will disappear okay. if the child develops pulmonary hypertension. Yes. This is my... This is I my... Think this one, uh, maybe, yeah, I don't know, maybe the scenario is not full here. Maybe that's why we cannot understand what it is. Yes, but pulmonary hypertension will never ever present with pansystolic murmur. No, this is so it will be loud, P2, yes. not the pansystolic. Yes. Yes. So these two are against of each other. Okay. If there is pulmonary hypertension, there should not be murmur. If there is murmur, this is not pulmonary hypertension. This is clear. Okay. Then mm -hmm. in pulmonary hypertension, there will be loud P2, not pansystolic murmur, not ejection, ejection systolic murmur, no murmur. It will be loud P2. Okay. Then yes, loud P2. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this the Down syndrome, we have to think. Down uh, sorry, Dr. Taman, Taman, I again interrupt. Uh, actually, uh, this question uh, we discussed in the morning, this Down syndrome, uh, then I rechecked. There can be murmur in uh, Eisenmenger. This is a wrong thinking that there cannot be any murmur. But why always we think that it can be VSD? Uh, it can be actually a TR murmur tricuspid regurge, which is also a pansystolic murmur. Okay. So I think this is Eisenmenger with the pulmonary hypertension leading to TR, tricuspid regurge, which is giving yeah, uh, a pansystolic murmur. Is it pansystolic murmur in TR? Or, yes, uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, it is a pansystolic, holosystolic murmur, yes. Holosystolic. Yes. Okay, that's a good uh, criteria, yes. If it is a pansystolic murmur, then it can be then it can be present as TR. Yeah, but not, not for VSD murmur. This is not VSD murmur. No, I know no, that. yes, yes. Yeah. 
but uh, but the important but, thing but, the age is very important because if the age for eisenminger should be more than 10 year but here no age so we don't know mm -hmm. okay Why but if we compile these things whole things that marmar pensistolic and the child is with cyanosis and clubbing and age is not given here so and the child is with is down syndrome so if we consider the whole scenario then uh, i think it is uh, better to say eisenmenger i don't know but uh, i agree with dr tahir that uh, tr can be associated with pulmonary hypertension but not pensistolic murmur for bsd it will be tr yes only this is the uh, way we can uh, uh, actually classify this case like down syndrome with eisenmenger uh, with tr this murmur is due to tr not bsd bsd always always shunt will be reversal if the shunt is reversed there will be no murmur for bsd normally we get pansystolic murmur for the vsd right and uh, this pansystolic murmur will be reversed when there is pulmonary hypertension shunt is reversed this much i know from the basic point and only possible this murmur is tr because whenever there is pulmonary hypertension right sided pressure is up that time there is tr in every pulmonary hypertension there is a mild to moderate variety of tr so this is only possibility and yes pulmonary hypertension can develop in uh, down child of course develop because they have high variety of vsd avsd they have many heart diseases so they can develop yeah it's very common in fact okay nine number nine let us start number nine is a uh, big boy with exudate in his tonsil and hard and soft palate uh, petechial hemorrhage glandular fever petechial hemorrhage okay, glandular fever so this is we discussed in the morning as white patch in the throat did you have white patch okay now next the last one baby girl with features of iron deficiency or i don't know okay same question another exam i remember a case of acute onset of acid paralysis with preceded by infection ascending manner it was very easy gbs okay so any child who is floppy with infection there is maybe respiratory infection gastrointestinal or uti even with uti and the child develop floppiness after that and this was very easy case gbs so they will ask you history you have to compile in your mind what history you can ask to the mother or parents uh, and then what examination finding and what are the differential diagnosis and what is the investigation of choice and up to this much we have to be clear after seeing a video like we have 3 minute time in this 3 minute you have to be sure that what you gonna tell the examiner and what are the dd of gbs who can tell us what are the dd of gbs transverse myelitis transverse myelitis very good yes yeah, botulism uh, polio uh, transverse myelitis polio. Uh, yes very good and you, you you i i i think you should always also know the uh, criteria how to differentiate between them like transverse myelitis will have a sensory level and uh, there is definitely bladder and bowel involvement but in gbs bladder and bowel involvement is a late little bit late last stage and there is no sensory level in gbs and diaphragm involvement can be in both cases and poliomyelitis is usually asymmetrical not like uh, gbs or uh, transverse myelitis it is usually asymmetrical one leg is more paralyzed no no uh, the bulbar polio okay bulbar polio is symmetrical yes you are right okay and there is another one the uh, stroke uh, Mean uh, spinal, uh, spinal shock. Spinal shock. You want to say yeah, yeah. spinal yeah. shock? Yeah, yeah. Spinal. Yes, spinal shock. And, there are three stages. And the tick paralysis is also very important. Lyme, Lyme disease. Yes, Lyme disease is bilateral, lower motor neuron palsy. Yes. So these are the lower motor neuron palsy, acute flaccid paralysis (DD), DDR, uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome, transverse myelitis, Lyme disease. 
then uh, bulbar folio, then uh, this much, right? Four, four uh, differential diagnosis. Yeah. Okay. And another is spinal shock, five. Spinal shock due to trauma into the spinal segment. Then spinal shock, lower motor neuron type of palsy. Okay, now next. Number two is another one, murmur, a machinery murmur in nature below the clavicle and saturation was 75. It was BT shunt. Okay, you know, this case we discussed, BT shunt, saturation low. That means there is no corrective surgery done, only palliative surgery done. A case with sudden onset of stridor and cyanosis and chest X-ray showing coin shadow. Bulbar polio should be last. Yes, because in UK, there is no polio. You are right. Almost globally eradicated. Very good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next. Uh, PDA would not have very low saturation SPO2. No, this is not PDA. We are discussing that it is a complex cardiac disease. Another one murmur, machinery murmur. This machinery murmur saturation will never be 75 if it is PDA. It is a complex complex cardiac disease. And BT shunt is a palliative procedure. It is done. That's why it is 75% saturation. Mean the child is not yet fully recovered. Yes. Okay, next. Ilhama, can you just read one minute? I, I need one to two minutes. You read, okay? This next question is question number three. Okay. Anyone? Okay. Okay, so a case with sudden onset of strider and cyanosis two years old and chest x-ray show coin shadow at the level of C4. What to do next? Endoscopy to remove. Another option. Sudden strider and sinuses, foreign body. Yeah, foreign body. And there is a coin at the level of C4. Mm -hmm. We will do the Removal. Just removal. Endoscopic removal. Bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopy. Yeah. Okay. And next four. In neonate with a, but here is a strider and cyanose. Only strider on so no any issue with the CPR. Okay. So four. Neonates with a particular rash just after delivery. Baby generally well. What action to do? Check CBC to look for the platelet. Because the baby generally maybe alumin or atomin thrombocytopenia. Another option? No. Okay, okay, next. We will take the CDC. Mm. Um, acute flaccid paralysis. In pediatric ICU, diagnose of GBS. Age is not given. Uh, it is GBS, acute flaccid plafara. Acute flaccid, we have to think about, um, ah, this is a Guillain-Barre syndrome, not GBS, Guillain-Barre syndrome, that diagnosis. GBS is Guillain-Barre, no? GBS yeah, yeah, Guillain it's also the same, this abbreviation. So this is Guillain-Barre, yeah, acute flaccid paralysis bilateral, as, uh, ascending. So what they want us to do, the diagnosis was uh, the Guillain-Barre. What do you do for diagnosis? As a diagnosis? Hmm. We will do uh, to how you will prove the diagnosis. You will see this um, in the CSF oligoclonal band, right? Mm. And uh, in the cytology yes. uh, yes. 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 And you will do this. Uh, we discussed now globulinocytological dissociation. Yes. Globulin yes. to be in place. Yes. Hmm? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We finished three, four, and five. Okay. Yeah, I think we should discuss this fourth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please discuss. I am here to discuss. <laughs> I like discussion. Yeah, because uh, you know, uh, uh, this is a neonate with particular rash just after delivery. Baby is well, so what to do? And it's a tricky one. Why not, muffin? Why not blueberry muffin? Why not neonatal alloimmune thrombocytopenia? Why not but autoimmune? Not He's telling what you will do. I told you we will do CBC. We will look for the plate. The first things. Yeah. And not yeah, exactly. plate that you will look. For. Maternal platelet and child platelet. Yes, very good. Yes. Ilhama is great, great. Ilhama. Yes. Then we should do septic screening, tort screening. Why we you want to do, do baby generally well, not unwell? 
Ah, so septic screening rule out, but torch screening you should do, my dear, because in torch child sometimes they are very well. But okay, the torch screening you will do if the baby IUGR early deliver and so on. So, if there is any cipula, mm. but here we don't have anything. If they give us IUGR and all those things, yes, you will think about the torch. If the baby is well, I I don't know. But uh, you know, Doctor Ilham, Doctor Ilham, you are saying that you will do CBC, but there is particular issue why you want to do CBC. Because I want to know whether the baby is having petechi. You want to check the platelet. I mean, platelet, basically. We want to check the platelet, not complete blood count. Yeah, you are right. Only platelet is enough. Or but I can do what? Yeah, I will check the platelet. Yeah. The I way to check platelets is by doing a full blood count. Yeah, platelets will be. Yes, that's what I mean. Another things before going for that, you check the maternal platelet. If it is normal and the baby has a petechi, then I will go for a neonatal. If the baby having low, I will not check. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You are right. No, but if, right. but if there is uh, Doctor Manna, but if there is petechial rash, is there any point to check for CBC for platelets? Because there is, it shows that there is thrombocytopenia. Sure. No, 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 Doctor Tahir, you cannot be so sure. Let petechial rash can be due to many causes, platelet cause, coagulation profile. You have to do platelet first, maternal and, and child. Then you have mm -hmm. to do coagulation profile also because we don't know this child is congenitally some coagulation defect. We don't know. CVI right. variety. So we have to do coagulation profile. We have to do complete, complete platelet count. But yes, I agree. No need of WBC here because this child is not septic. Because Ilhama nicely explained, but if this child was tortured, then she should be IUGR. There, the child is well looking good, everything is good. So, we hope this is not torch, this is not septic child. So, what are the other reasons of petechial rash in a neonate? Number one, alloimmune, number one, number two, autoimmune, number three, coagulation defect. This is the three cause only. Okay, among these three cause, alloimmune, autoimmune, two. I think yes. in this case, uh, if I'm presented with this video, I will not opt for CBC first. I'll first opt for history. I'll take the history from the mother. Is there, is yes. the mother is using any drugs? Is the mother is having any condition, blood condition? That's the first thing, Dr. Tahir, you will have. Uh, they, will yeah. 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 they will ask you, after seeing the video, they will ask you what are the questions you will ask in history. Yes. From there you will be right, right, right. Okay, which medication you think can cause a PTK in the baby if the mother is taking? No, yeah, I mean the, the medication. The medication means that uh, if the mother is on medication, it means that it is a maternal ITP. Yeah, I got you. But uh, you say it. I will check which medication is the mother taking, isn't it? Just I won't ask the, which the medication can cause on the baby PTK if the mother is taking. No, 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 you, you didn't yeah. get my point. No, no, my no, no. Point. I, got, I got, I got Dr. Tahir, I got you. That mother is ITP or not. Be Besides asking medication history, you can ask that uh, if mother has, uh, wait, okay. wait, if mother has uh, any disease, long-standing disease, we can ask, right? Mm -hmm. If you have any autoimmune disease, if mother has, because this is autoimmune thrombocytopenia. So autoimmune thrombocytopenia means mother has disease. Okay, in that case, check mother's platelet. Okay, and uh, this is number one, check mother's platelet, number two, check baby's platelet, number three, check baby's coagulation profile. Now, which coagulation defect can cause neonatal thrombocytopenia? My question is, if it is severe variety of, uh, suppose, von Willebrand quantitative defect, or severe variety of common pathway defect, factor 10 deficiency, it can present as mid petechial rash, right? Or I am wrong? It can be severe variety. I think petechial rash is, is, is not quite a feature of the, of the coagulopathy. Low? Sorry, your voice is interrupting. Interrupting, yeah. Yeah. But what we get, I agree with him that particular rash is not the feature of uh, von Willebrand. Von Willebrand will present with uh, mucocutaneous yeah. bleeding, actually. Yes, I'm, I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Mm -hmm. So petechial rash mainly due to platelet defect. Okay. And yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's mainly, it's mainly uh, platelets or, or vasculitis. Vasculitis, or most yes. Platelets, yeah. 
Actually, I know this case for number four case is neonatal. You have to differentiate alloimmune and autoimmune colors. This is the idea that the examiner want to know that you know the difference between autoimmune and alloimmune. Exactly. Because uh, Dr. Taman, uh, when we used to study for our FCPS, the petechial rash in a neonate, it has a very narrow uh, sort of uh, DDs, like alloimmune, maternal ITP, and uh, torch and hand shoulder Christian disease. These three, four were the only uh, things which we used to put in the differential of neonatal with thrombocytopenia. The well baby, not sick baby. Okay, I have a voice note, okay, of neonatal autoimmune and autoimmune. I can share that one, okay? We will uh, read that from that note that I made for my students, which is very good. You can go through. If you have any confusion of autoimmune, autoimmune, anyone, uh, they can go through this. I made a note. Okay, so this question that I understood that the actual examiner want to see that you know the difference between autoimmune and autoimmune. And if anyone has any uh, confusion, please you go through because these two topics are very, very common in UK. And they use uh, like <clears throat> blood transfusion, even platelet concentrate for the uh, alloimmune because there is severe thrombocytopenia and bleeding. Okay. And you cannot give father and mother's blood because father and mother blood is cross connect, cross match, a crisscross. They are actually reacting with each other. So you cannot give paternal blood. No, uh, uh, Dr. Tamanda, you can give maternal platelets. Uh, but uh, it is advised that do not give father and mother's platelet in alloimmune, especially. No, because, uh, yeah, I'm talking about the alloimmune, because in alloimmune, if you see the chemistry, it's actually the against the father antigen, father the antigen. antibodies. Yes. So uh, there is nothing to do with the mother. So you have to give the mother blood, the mother uh, platelets. Okay. And the only thing you have to do is to do HPA1A uh, antigen. You have to check for this. Yes. Yes. Human that must be matched. HPA1A matched. Yeah. You must. You have to do this one. Okay. So this is about autoimmune and autoimmune. Now next is PICO child with uh, paralysis, classic paralysis. It is GBS. It can be transverse myelitis. It can be bulbar polio. But bulbar polio we should not talk because it is eradicated almost. So we should talk about GBS and transverse myelitis. What is the level of transverse myelitis that can cause quadriplegia? It should be above um, T1. Okay, it should be above T1 in the cervical segment uh, because there's quadriplegic, quadriplegic, GB, uh, quadriplegia for involvement of both limbs, you should have cervical cord, co cervical cord uh, transverse section myelitis. Okay. And below thoracic, uh, there is a um, lower half of the body. Okay, the lower of the disease, the lower of the segment, then the less of the limb involved. Now, high stepping gait. High stepping gait, we know, due to uh, this is charcot merit tooth disease, or uh, that is, what are the other diseases which have high stepping gait? Any, any other input, high stepping gait? Peripheral neuropathy, I know peripheral neuropathy. Uh, Dr. Tamanna, if bilateral, then mm -hmm. you have two duties. Uh, mm -hmm. One is, as you said, and the other is any spinal lesion. And if unilateral, only one differential, and that is peroneal nerve injury. Okay, okay, this much, okay, this much we also know. Let us check again, what is the high stepping gait, causes of high stepping gait or foot drop or um, this is high stepping gate pictures you can see i hope and uh, step occur high stepping gate see these are the causes of high stepping gate if you see this picture high stepping gate Okay, so this is sciatic neuropathy, peroneal neuropathy, bilateral is distal polyneuropathy, and lumbosacral polyradiculone. My question is GBS, GBS transverse myelitis. They also have high stepping gait, no? Because they are also they are also lower motor neuron palsy, peripheral nerve. GBS is 
Gwen Berry syndrome is polyradicular neuropathy. So this is also neuropathy, right? So in this case also, we can uh, see there is high stepping gait. So see, this is, is a polyneuropathy, polyradicular neuropathy. Yeah, charcot Marie tooth is a lower motor neuron disease, but what are the other diseases? <clears throat> Any disease which can develop, which can involve the neurons, the lower limb. And unilateral is peroneal nerve injury, sciatic nerve injury, lumbar five, radiculopathy. Character is weakness of the ankle dorsiflexion, money foot drop. Weakness of the ankle dorsiflexor muscle. Okay. And foot is lifted high when walking. So these are almost the DD of uh, high stepping gait. Okay. Okay. So this is the high stepping gait. Now next is a well neonate with PTG and platelet count of two. What to do next? Platelet count is 2000 or something. Okay. Uh, they did not actually, it is printing mistake. So a well neonate with PTG and low platelet. Definitely again, yellow immune and autoimmune thrombocytopenia. So this is a very common topic, okay, for our video station. Ah, Frederick ataxia. But Frederick ataxia has, I think, ataxic gait. They will not have high stepping gait, right? It's different. Ataxic gait and high stepping gait is different. Frederick's ataxia, they have ataxic gait. Ataxic gait, yes. Okay. Next, branchial cyst of or midline cystic hygroma with uh, tracheostomy scar. Uh, uh, okay, so we know the midline swelling, we know the lateral swelling. So branchial cyst is a lateral and midline or midline cystic hygroma. Cystic hygroma does not present in midline. So this is actually lateral swelling of the neck with tracheostomy scar because there was compression, compression in the trachea. So they did tracheostomy scar. There, is, there was a swelling and it was compressing the trachea. So we know cystic hygroma prognosis is not so good. We know yesterday that cystic hygroma, there is a recurrence of collection and it compresses the structures. So the prognosis is not so good. Now, there was a strange video of toddler, miserable, walking around the room in nappy. I think to see the gate in 10 seconds to the end, same baby of the itchy rash in arms and back. Ah, this is chicken pox, right? Cerebellitis. A video of toddler who is walking like here and there. Gate was like drunken gait, cerebellitis, this is. And there was itchy rash in the arms and back. So this can be chicken pox, right? Next. I remember a video of a child with significant asthmatic bleeding. Yes. Any, anyone? Yeah, so, yeah, no, I just had a query about the post, when does the post cerebellar, um, I mean, post varicella cerebellitis manifest? Um, like, After the, the duration rest. between the manifestation and the rash. Because it seems like this baby still has an ongoing itchy rash mm. and misery. This is also, yeah, important question. It can be another... DD, like scabies, but why they are showing us the gait? Scabies has no relation with the gait. Cerebritis in the video, it, uh, features usually occurs earlier. It's not so much late, probably after about two weeks. Okay. But our it's not that, is, not, not that late. Okay. But if the rash is totally disappeared from the body by then, no, I think because, because a chickenpox rash is now we like wax and when it, yeah, yeah, it takes time yes it takes time because some crops are healing and some crops are new crops some are healing some are new like this so chicken pox actually many days it stay in the body and i sh i saw the children have extensive lesion of chicken pox and children usually have many many new bouts of lesion i mean some lesions are healing and some new are growing so uh, in which period there will be cerebellitis it is difficult because as soon as the autoantibody develop it is a kind of autoimmune process right autoimmune cerebellitis it is a kind of so as soon as uh, the infection uh, agent uh, it triggers the immune process of the body and then they can start cerebellar attack so uh, how many times it takes this is actually uncertain if in the video there was a gate and uh, there was an itchy rash 
we have to think this might be a like ataxic gait. We we will see definitely if the gait is ataxic, then it is cerebellitis. But if the gait is normal, and there is scratch mark, itchiness, we have to think about like scabies or psoriasis or eczema, any skin lesion. But if it is related, if it is related with walking, then maybe it is cerebellitis. I don't know what was the exact rash pattern of rash. But these rashes of this uh, chicken pox are uh, it is not the usual sight. This uh, arms and the back. Mm. As far as concerned, it is less likely towards this chicken pox. Chicken pox occurs in the corp. No, corp means body. Back is no. a part of. Ah uh, yes, but more of the trunk and body. Yes, body is in the back, in the head. Even chicken pox occur in the mouth. No, yes, the first lesions appear on the trunk in chicken box, but uh, our RCPC people they consider face only first. Hmm. This is the problem. This is, is in our book. It is given trunk. First appears on the trunk at different crops at different time, but the yeah. people uh, understand first face first. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I had argue. I had argument, big argument with them. They didn't. But reply the But I saw, I saw hundred percent people of having rash in the back. I saw because they have body, what whole they, body. What they say, say, this appears first on the face and then spread. They okay. people say like this. And what we say, we say first trunk and then to the face and everywhere. Centri, it is like centripetal and centrifugal. Okay, centripetal means concentrate on the body, and centrifugal means it is concentrate on the arms like this. Centripetal and centrifugal. There are two types of rash, na. No? Okay. Okay. So we have to see the gait actually. If it is drunken gait, if it is like cerebellar gait, then it is cerebellitis. Otherwise, it can be scabies, it can be eczema, it can be psoriasis because itchy rash everywhere. Okay. Now, I remember a video of a child with significant acidotic breathing, history of abdominal pain, and altered consciousness. The question was, what to do next? So this is DKA. We will do random blood sugar. Another question for the same video: What is the direct cause of death in such situation? It is brain edema. Yes, cerebral edema. Direct cause of death. Another cause of death is hypoglycemic coma. This is also said. Another cause of death is sepsis. So the leading cause of death in uh, DKA is three. Number one is cerebral edema, then hypoglycemic coma, then sepsis. Next number eleven, child with extensive rash of ITP. What is the management of ITP? In ITP, treat the patient, not the platelet. Below ten thousand, usually we give platelet. And if the child is more than ten thousand, it is clinically fine. There is no neurological sign, no bleeding. You will not give platelet. If there is a joint bleeding, or bleeding from the mucous membrane, or bleeding from the head in intracranial, then we will give platelet. Otherwise, we don't give. And before giving prednisolone, uh, we you must do uh, a bone marrow before because you have to rule out leukemia. Okay. Okay. Next. Next is child with neck mass, mainly torticollis. So this is, I think, um, um, uh, that is called what? Sternocleidomastoid. Sternocleidomastoid. Yes. Sternocleidomastoid abscess or tumor, uh, because there is torticollis. Yeah. Okay. Next. Neonate with features of Down. What investigation you will do? Karyotype. Okay. Uh, girl with sudden onset of tremor. What is the diagnosis? Thyroid. Hyperthyroid, right? Hyperthyroidism has tremor. Hypothyroid has tremor? No. No. Only hyperthyroid has tremor. Yeah, hyper. Hyper. Yes. Child with acute onset of Bell's palsy. Answer was screening for herpes simplex virus. Yes, acute onset. Acha, why herpes simplex? Bell's palsy is more common for herpes. Uh, what is that called? Uh, Ramsehan syndrome. Yeah, it's common in herpes. Okay, Ramsehan. Yeah, Ramsehan. So this is Ramsehan. What are the features of Ramsehan? Only Bell's palsy and hearing loss. Is there any hearing loss? No. And vesicles uh, in the distribution of uh, this uh, ophthalmic nerve. Mm -hmm. But Bell's palsy is not synonymous with the Ramsey hand. 
yeah so what are the features of ramse hunt uh, ramse hunt actually there is uh, vesicles over the external ear the pinna and uh, there can be uh, vesicle inside the facial canal so there is compression of the nerve uh, inside the facial canal leading to bell's palsy facial nerve inside the facial canal is injured so my question is nerve to the cauda tympani there is vesicle oh. in external of the craniacus my nerve to the tympani is involved yes, or not there is vesicles in the external auditory canal mm -hmm. until the meatus yeah i know but my my question is there are terminal branches of uh, facial nerve in the facial canal five terminal branches like ophthalmic maxillary mandibular and cervical like this buccal like this five terminal branches and also there are some other nerve like nerve to the stapedius if the nerve to the stapedius is involved then there is hearing loss if the nerve to the cauda tympani is involved then taste sensation is lost and you to third so my question is uh, is this involved nerve to the stapedius or nerve to the cauda tympani in this ramse hunt uh, i don't know we need to see that mm, very good question okay i hope this is a small place of uh, learning uh, we will see that question because there are five terminal branch but there are separate other branch like nerve to the cauda tympani nerve to the stapedius these are also small branches of facial nerve okay now next then uh, ramsey hunt is, is due to happy zoster not not hsv not happy not simplex aiva this is not happy simplex happy zoster this is shingles not happy simplex happy simplex is no dermatomal dermatomal is varicella not happy simplex yeah okay varicella is dermatomal so shingles is dermatomal hmm so bell's palsy is not by herpes simplex virus yes this is herpes family but not herpes simplex it is varicella varicella zoster Okay now yeah, next yeah not not herpes simplex herpes yes, herpes herpes family but you have to name the virus virus is varicella herpes is the family of the virus okay among them there are seven viruses herpes simplex 1 herpes simplex 2 varicella zoster 8 8 yes there are 8 7 to 8 viruses epstein bar virus then uh, cytomegalovirus they are all in the herpes family okay now so this is important okay ramsey hunt with bell's palsy this this is uh, every year like one after another session they are giving in every year now child with mild to moderate stridor only say ramsey hunt if they've given us vesicles and if they speak about um... i think a hearing deficit or something but if they just mention facial weakness then it's it's bell's palsy yes uh, besides yeah. bell's palsy is the, is the commonest so bell's palsy may or may not be part of the complex of uh, ramsey Ramse hunt yes exactly bell's palsy may be maybe with ramsey hunt without ramsey hunt yes agree and ramsey hunt okay let us see the ramsey hunt what are the other actually because it's pretty confusing ramsey hunt mm, let us just uh, see few line about the ramsey hunt okay ramsey hunt ramsey hunt hunt syndrome okay so ramsey hunt is herpes zoster okay it is not uh, herpes simplex it is herpes zoster virus occur when there is shingle outbreak affect the facial nerve near of the ear in addition to the painful shingle rash ramsey hunt can cause facial palsy and hearing loss this is what i i wanted to know there is a uh, hearing loss and it is which type of hearing loss it is definitely sensory neural hearing loss not conductive okay so ramsey hunt is caused by the same virus of the chicken pox same virus after chicken pox clear up 
the virus still live in your nerve. Years later, it may be reactive. When it does, it can affect your facial nerve. Prompt treatment of Ramsey syndrome can reduce the risk of complication. So there can be permanent facial weakness and deafness. So you have to do prompt prompt uh, uh, treatment. So treatment is not like supportive. You have to give steroid. Okay, this is facial paralysis. Sometimes uh, can happen before others. So there is ear pain, hearing loss, tinnitus, uh, difficulty in closing the eyes, sensation of uh, vertigo. See, inner air also involved because there is vertigo. Okay, and uh, taste sensation. See, I, I, I wanted to know this thing, taste sensation. Taste sensation, that means nerve to the corda tympani. Nerve to the corda tympani also lost. And dry mouth and eye. Okay. Okay, any more question from this? So Ramsehan involved tinnitus, vertigo, hearing loss, Bell's, Bell's palsy, and then taste sensation loss. Okay. Okay, now next is child with mild to moderate strider. So you have to follow up. Follow up means observing for four to six hours. And severe strider, admit. This is group laryngotracheobronchitis. Next is child with rash after drug therapy. <clears throat> drug therapy means any uh, um, drug that can cause Steven Johnson syndrome. So the differential is Steven Johnson and SSSS. Okay, next. Child with limping gait and arthritis need NSAID. Uh, so this may be a case of, I don't know, what is it, GIA? Because if it is transient cyanobitis, we give only paracetamol, not NSAID. If it is reactive, only paracetamol. If you need NSAID, then it is GIA. Maybe secular. Maybe sickle cell, yes. But in sickle cell, very careful about aspirin. Okay, in sickle cell, be careful. Aspirin causes chance of bleeding. Now, sickle cell, there is also chance of bleeding, or there is anemia. <clears throat> so, in sickler, we usually do not give NSAID. Okay. okay. Sickle cell, you know, if there is severe arthritis, we give morphine. In sickle cell anemia, if it is severe. Next, infant with epidermolysis bullosa. So epidermolysis bullosa treatment is like, like Steven Johnson, skin care, hydration, urine output, then uh, antibiotic for infection control, <clears throat> then ophthalmological consultation, eye ointment. So, and skin care is very important. You have to own dressing, cover the own like this. Epidermolysis bullosa, there are different types of epidermolysis bullosa, like simplex, junctional. Hand food mouth disease is by Coxsackie A virus, mainly. What are the other virus of hand food mouth disease? There are other virus, human herpes virus, HHV. Human herpes virus and uh, Coxsackie A. And there is no treatment for hand foot mouth, only supportive treatment like paracetamol. And no investigation needed. Now Epstein-Barr virus in with palatal hemorrhage. Yes, PTG, um, PTG in the palate. And there may be exudate in the tonsil. And this organomegaly, there may be features of pancytopenia, so there can be petechial rash in the body. The patient presented with fever, low-grade fever for long duration, and the patient is not improving by antibiotic. And the investigation of choice is Epstein-Barr virus, what, IgM, IgG? Huh? What is the investigation for Epstein-Barr? Or ELISA, something like that. Anyone, any idea in Epstein-Barr virus infection? Urine, 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 urine culture. Urine culture. 
Epstein Barr, na? No, no, no Epstein Barr will do ABV PCR. Uh, urine is for CMV. And what is? Yeah, monos sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, PCR. And what is mono monospot test? They, what that's what Paul Bandala or monospot. That is important in AB, ABV. Yeah, what? Which kind of test? It is IgM, IgG. IgM, IgG. Okay. No, the Paul Bandala test. No, I don't have any idea. Anyone? Uh, but it is a blood test. Yeah, it actually shows the atypical lymphocytes in the blood. That is CBC, PBS. That is different, and yeah, Paul Bunnell yeah. test is different. What is Paul Bunnell test or monospot test? What is this? ELISA. I think ELISA. ELISA is Paul Bunnell. Anyone? Yahana Il Ilhama, any idea? Anyone? What is Paul Bunnell or monospot? It's called heterophile antibody test. Mm -hmm. Heterophile antibody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, heterophile antibody test. Okay. Also yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I remember the name. Heterophile antibody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is heterophile antibody or another name is Paul Barnell. Another name is monospot. It is most accurate test for epstein barr virus. More than IgM, IgG. This is the most accurate test and most quick test. Monospot. We can do by one or two days of fever. We can do Okay, so this is test. And what is treatment of infectious mononucleosis? Anyone have any idea? Supportive treatment, but do we have any antiviral or antibiotic? No, no, no not only symptomatic. No. Symptomatic, okay. And prevent this um, uh, sport for three Even months or sport, six months? Yes, yes. Mane, the patient cannot do active sport. Outdoor play is contraindicated because there is a chance of skin rupture. Mm -hmm. Liver rupture. Okay. Yes. Now next is cranial nerve infection. Clean, clean, clean. Yes, clean. What is cranial nerve infection? What is that? Cranial nerve infection? <laughs> I don't know. What infection? Bell's palsy. <laughs> what is this? Okay. Uh, mastoiditis. We read details yesterday. Mastoiditis. There is a clear picture and different differential diagnosis is nine, non-accidental injury. Okay, next is status asthmaticus, we discussed in the morning. And bronchiolitis, we discussed. Guaynbari syndrome, what is the follow up? What is follow up of Guaynbari syndrome? What is follow up? Spirometry. Spirometry by you, by spirometry, what do you see? You see the uh, force, no. Lung, 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 function. lung function, yeah, but which, which variety? We see forced vital capacity, FVC, or which variety we see, or APV1? Peak expiratory flow rate, uh, usually bedside, we can see peak. Yes. yes. Peak expiratory flow metry, usually we do in the bedside, not like our obstructive pattern or restrictive pattern. We don't see obstructive or restrictive pattern. We see peak expiratory flow. No. That is lung function, but not like spirometry. We do mainly PEFR. It is reduced in Guanbury syndrome. It is reduced, and this is a bad prognostic sign if it is reduced. Okay. Okay. Any more question up to this? Next. If anyone have any input or output, you can tell. Okay. Dr. Tamanna, in this uh, uh, spirometry for GBS, don't we look for the vital capacity? I'm not sure. Peak flow is uh, we see, na? peak flow. We see bedside, we see bedside. Now we don't do lung function tests like big machine. We don't do by this. We do, we do okay. only peak flow. And peak right. flow meter by, by that you cannot see for force vital. Force vital capacity actually, this is the peak flow. How many forcefully you see? Nah? This, is a, this is a small bedside test. I know this much only. This is a small bed bedside test. I never saw any GBS patient uh, having for spirometry. I saw only pyknometry. Because this we see through involvement of the diaphragm. If the diaphragm is involved, then there is a chance of, uh, I mean, failure, respiratory failure, and the child and the child will go into ventilator ultimately. Am I correct? Uh, have you ever seen the big machine spirometry? No, we see only uh, this uh, uh, like pyknometry. 
Okay. Uh, so disseminated BCG vaccine. What does that mean? I mean, after BCG vaccine, there is a, a big, big uh, abscess or lymphadenopathy. This is actually BCG adenitis or side effect of BCG vaccine. Okay. In this, uh, the so Cox phenomenon. What is that Cox? Yes. Cox phenomenon. K O C H, na Cox. Exactly. Exactly. So this phenomena is actually reactivation of the virus, mycobacterium tuberculosis, reactivation. And this management, if there is abscess, you have to drain. If and drain and then give antibiotic and then send to the infectious disease team because this is a special type of TB. You need give you need to give rifampicin isoniazide like this. So in this case, you will refer this case to the infectious control team because this is complicated case and pediatrician usually don't deal such cases. But if there is any pass, any uh, abscess, you have to drain. Pass is anywhere you have to drain, even if it is BCG pass, BCG adenitis or something. Next is eye infection with herpes simplex. Yeah, this is after five days is chlamydia. And before five days is uh, Neisseria, gonorrhea. But my question is, what is the time of herpes? Within five days or after five days? Herpes simplex ophthalmitis. Anyone, any idea? What is the time? I don't quite remember, but I think it's... Um... Uh, Dr. Tamanna, if, uh, if the mother, uh, she has a active herpes of the genital, then it will present at birth. Mm. At but birth, if she... Yeah. Yeah, but if she has, if she had past uh, herpes, uh, so it will not be active herpes. It will not be at birth. There will so, be only antibodies in the child. Herpes of Thelmicus in neonate. You are right. I am. I also agree that it can present at birth because if the mother has genitalia, herpes in the genitalia, that is HSV type two virus two. Okay, so herpes joster. No, I'm herpes of thalamicus in neonate. Herpes simplex in neonate. Okay, eye infection with herpes simplex in neonate. Yes, if the mother has type 2 infection, okay, then there is problem. Newborn. So this is newborn. One newborn child actually they present in newborn money within five days, more than five days. This is not like day specific, but if the mother has involvement of eye, involvement of genital ear with herpes, then the in newborn can develop yeah. herpes. Herpes. Herpes simplex. Okay, actually this is not so common. And there is a there is a management in the neonatal guideline that if the mother has herpes simplex, active herpes simplex, then we should not do normal vaginal delivery. We should do caesarean section. Neonatal herpes simplex virus infection. Uh, in associated with significant mortality and mortality. Uh, neonatal herpes simplex infection generally acquire in the peri peripartum period and can be devastating if not diagnosed. Okay. Yes. So you have to give actually treatment as to neonate for this because it can be very serious condition. Okay. Numerous viruses are capable of infection of central nervous system of neonate, but herpes simplex is most severe and significant mortality, morbidity. Another is herpes simplex causes hepatitis, you know, neonatal hepatitis and neonatal eye, neonatal meningitis. So it is very dangerous. You have to give IV. Uh, herpes simplex, double stranded types of maternal infection. Okay. Mode of delivery, cesarean versus normal vaginal delivery. Clinical manifestation. Okay, there are three categories of infection. Uh, there is a, like disseminated infection that has skin, CNS, eye, and mouth. This is disseminated disease. 
and there are other varieties of neonatal herpes so neonatal herpes is quite vast okay diagnosis is by swabbing from the affected area conjunctiva mouth nasopharynx and specimen of the skin vesicles cerebrospinal fluid whole blood sample pcr alino alanine amino transfer is because the hepatic involvement we have to do sgpt alt actually and lumbar puncture csf for herpes simplex cns infection okay so this is quite serious and treatment is before antiviral therapy were developed death rate was high but now with antiviral death rate becomes slower okay acyclovir high dose acyclovir 10 day 10 day of um, high dose acyclovir you can give okay so this is the this is actually can develop just after birth and it is disseminated okay next breath holding attack so we discussed today uh, that there are certain differential diagnosis of breath holding attack like uh, cyanotic spill breath holding attack then tet spill cyanotic spill then jard jard mane um, sandifer syndrome then reflex anoxic seizure okay bronchiolitis pertussis case then lower limb examination show features of guanberry syndrome so everywhere they are they saying spirometry i don't know but we don't do spirometry in gbs why they are saying spirometry anyone any idea about this yeah dr tamanna spirometry is very very important uh, for the for, uh, outcome of gbs that how the gbs is progressing because it's a simple thing that if there is a muscle weakness so the spirometry will be worse so with spirometry you are seeing that he is getting worse or he is getting better it's a bad side test okay yes you are right dr tahir see force vital capacity we see by spirometry but force vital capacity we cannot see by uh, pic flowmeter yeah we can see by fvc by spirometry you are right the force vital capacity is very useful in guiding deposition and disposition and therapy patient with force vital capacity less than 15 to 20 ml per kg okay they are very uh, high grade okay so this is medscape reference okay force vital capacity we usually we usually do So next, next is uh, infant with rash around the mouth and anus and foot. So this is acrodermatitis enteropathica. We will give zinc, zinc supplementation. And infant with infantile spasm. This is we will do EEG. Yes, West syndrome. And treatment is uh, what is the treatment? we give prednisolone right corticosteroid is a first line treatment if it is tuberous sclerosis we will give rigabatrin yeah acth is second line but first line is prednisolone now conjunctivitis is not responding to flu clocks with vesicle around the eye okay this may be herpes simplex or varicella not sure but if it is dermatomal then it is not herpes simplex it is varicella zoster or herpes zoster okay so if it is uh, dermatomally distributed we have to see is it dermatomal in these cases we have to refer to the pediatric ophthalmologist now infant with bark barking cough what investigation barking cough mane stridor stridor that is uh, um, what is that laryngotracheobronchitis so we will not do anything but if it is pertussis pertussis then we will do what Yes, also up. Pardon, yes, also up. Forgot it. La part of this. Neonate with rash. <clears throat> so this is a uh, toxicum. It is a more toxicum. That is reassurance. Infant with lymphadenopathy disseminated BCG. So disseminated BCG comes actually exam right. But in UK, uh, BCG is. I uh, mean, TB is not so common. Also, BCG vaccine is not so common. 
we give only high risk patient who has the upper third generation who has travel of endemic country like but they this scenario are coming in exam now in fact two weeks after abdominal surgery with complication option liver abscess cholangitis peritonitis ah yeah after surgery abdominal surgery uh if it is biliary atresia there is a complication of cholangitis ascending cholangitis yes wound infection ascending cholangitis these two are the complication of biliary atresia i don't know this this is they are asking about this one because two week after two weeks of age which operation in the abdomen usually biliary atresia or intestinal obstruction these two are the common or hernia or valvulus like this so the complication if it is biliary atresia then the answer is cholangitis or wound infection next is history of fever and diarrhea in the video there is a rash baby is active acha so what is this case fever and diarrhea with rash uh, what is the diagnosis hemolytic uremic syndrome aiva but baby is active hemolytic uremic syndrome baby is very sick na baby menon shalen purpura can we think mm menon shalen purpura does not present with diarrhea they present with abdominal pain arthritis as has but he has to be sick they will be sick yeah it could be this one uh, adenovirus fever with diarrhea acrodermatitis enteropathica but there is no fever in acrodermatitis enteropathica no no I, adenovirus can also come with the fever and diarrhea adenovirus yeah you are right and some virus can cause fever and diarrhea and they can cause rash yes you are right adenovirus and there is another virus na no? oh, that is spread and in the hospital antivirus antivirus and then uh, there is norovirus virus they all norovirus virus yes norovirus norovirus yes you are right actually i don't know this is it can be has if the child is very sick and has management is very no, very we can't talk of uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome without having been told about the renal functions or the platelets um we, we yeah. need to figure out the trend yeah. for us have there is triad hemolytic uremic syndrome there is triad hemolysis features of hemolysis there is low platelet count and there is a uh, high creatinine high creatinine the child will be very septic looking and has management is always always in the tertiary care center when there is where there is neuro uh, renal unit because it is every has is an emergency pediatric emergency this is important okay every has is a pediatric emergency because you have to be prepared for the dialysis okay let me see that chat Oh, oh, there is many, many chat. Okay, let me read. Hmm. Ramsey-Hunt syndrome is a rare neurological disorder caused by paralysis of the facial nerve, rash affecting the ear or mouth. Ear abnormalities such as ringing in the ear, hearing loss may be present. Yes. Okay. Shingle outbreak. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. bcg phenomena the name is bcg osis if there is tumor this is called bcg osis another is bcg adenitis bcg osis and bcg adenitis okay okay so next next is uh, yeah we know this uh, neonatal rash neonatal rash it is where are we okay diarrhea number 41 now we had gbs for spirometry also yeah 42 little girl with purpuric rash it is itp okay itp the child will be well looking yes now small boy with ataxia and chicken pox small boy with ataxia and so this this is very common video topic right cerebellitis chicken pox cerebellitis a boy with cystic fibrosis and wheeze with eosinophilic aspergillosis aiva so in 
as per genosis, we have to measure the eosinophil count also. Total eosinophil count will be raised. Mm? And what is the treatment of this amphotericin B, IV amphotericin B? Okay. And Dr. Tahir said yesterday, if it is aspergilloma, then we will use uh, steroid, corticosteroid. Okay, next, asthmatic new patient asking for investigation. Asthma new patient, what investigation we do? We don't do any investigation. We do only spirometry to see the lung function and pick flow diary. Is there any investigation we do for asthma? As and, uh, no. No, eosinophil count we measure to see the allergic level, IgE level, eosinophil count, we check uh, for uh, uh, no, combat of allergy, but not directly for asthma. Asthma is a clinical diagnosis, but we will do spirometry and we will do peak flowmetry. Okay, any, any more comments? No. Okay. Next, uh, cervical lymph node, cat scratch disease, IVA. And another lymph node that is peri preauricular. That is also we see in our picture, preauricular and cervical cat scratch disease. And this is painful, right? Painful, tender lymph node. And mycobacterium usually non-tender. The pre infant with generalized skin rash. What it can be? It can be pustular melanosis. Uh, it can be toxicum, erythema toxicum. If it is uh, like skin peeling, then it can be epidermolysis bullosa. Now, neonate in NIC with dehydration. How to manage neonate with dehydration? Who can tell us how you manage a child neonate with dehydration? If the child is in shock, we'll give 20, 20 ml per kg normal saline. If not in shock, how you calculate the fluid? There are stages of dehydration, like severe dehydration, moderate dehydration, some dehydration. Moderate dehydration, I think um, 75 ml per kg for four hours. Is this applicable for neonate also? It is applicable for children. I don't know for neonate also. If, uh, as per guideline, it, it depends on the patient in shock or not. If the patient is conscious, not in shock, try to always oral. If in shock, then you will go for IV. Okay, yes. Yes, yeah, this is a very good point. Yes, but... Uh, in the neonate, is, is that still applicable in the neonate? Yes, breastfeeding. Yes, breastfeeding. Even you know, hypernatremia. Yes, hypernatremia management, even they are doing by breastfeeding only in unit. I read in the blue book, hypernatremia in unit. They are not giving any IV fluid. They are giving only oral breastfeeding. If the hypernatremia is more than 170, then only they are giving IV fluid. Otherwise, they are not giving. Okay, okay so neonatal, de neonatal dehydration. You have clarify on the, on, the, um, on the amount of, of uh, fluids that we give in shock in a unit. Is it 20 or 10 mils? 20, 20. As it's a different part, is 20. 20, yes. <laughs> but my question is, if this neonate is dehydrated and we only give, uh, you only give breastfeeding, okay, is it enough? Or we should also give some maintenance IV fluid? No, I think. I'm not sure. Hypernatremic is different uh, compared to uh, the other one in the hypernatremic, I think you have to give the fluid. Yeah, actually, yes, yes, in new nets, uh, that's a different protocol for uh, rehydration as compared to the other pro protocol of rehydration that is uh, no summer severe that mm. uh, that is applicable from two months of age and onwards. Yeah. So, in new, yeah. in new natal, if child is not taking then we will give maintenance fluids and also the deficit fluids. Or deficit, we will calculate like whether the child is a 5, 10, or 15 percent deficit according to dehydration. And okay. there is a protocol to give this deficit over 24 hours, like in first uh, eight hours, uh, how much we will give, and then in the next 16 hours. 
one third is given in first eight hours and the two third is one, next sixteen hours. This is the deficit along with maintenance fluid. So these are the replacement, and also we will replace the fluids uh, for the ongoing losses as well. From where? From where we will read this? From neonatal guideline, I think. Neonatal blue blue book. This one. Yes, I think. Yes, I think, and also neonatal. in Gomella neonatology they have written. But yes, in the neonatal book they have also written according to the in the neonatology book they have written. You know, rehydration according to the like uh, electrolyte balance whether the child is hyponatremic dehydration or hyponatremic dehydration or isonatremic dehydration according to that we will mm. rehydrate the child mm. okay yes and, right. and, and, and in shock and in shock in every unit we will not give 20 ml per kg there are some cases like in preterm child and in the child with this uh, birth asphyxia We give uh, the first bolus with 10 ml per kg. There is restriction, and oh. there is the third condition which I forgot. Otherwise, in every uh, full term and and with no other condition, we give 20 ml per kg bolus. Okay, shock. Okay, okay, uh, okay let me just uh, share one neonatal blue book. This one from our. Let me check because it is very important. We should check this one. Gaidan is giving the rehydration as before four years and after four years. Okay, Ilhama, what is the page number of these guidelines? Blue book. Uh, I'm opening pediatric guideline page ninety-seven. No, no, not pediatric. Open the blue book. This one. Open this one. Blue book. Don't I tell? Ah, oh, okay. Open this blue book. I shared with you. Okay, this blue book open. <laughs> what is the page number? Tell us. We will read. Okay, this. Uh, neonatal dehydration neonatal management is different than pediatric management any in many aspect hmm. okay ilhama will read for us let us move okay you start slowly where is the page number of neonatal dehydration 143 143 243 can you just tell us what is the protocol One second, let me open. Yeah, what they are saying there. Um, procedure. You have to check the pH. And the gastric fluid. One second. Okay, we have to start. This is very important. Neonatal dehydration. How you will gonna gonna manage Nu nutrition and enteral enteral feeding. Ilama, nutrition and enteral feeding. Page number two five six. Two five six. Nutrition and enteral feeding. Is it this one? No, this is not the one. Yeah, no, no, no. No, no, no. Okay, we have to search where which chapter is dehydration chapter. Okay, we have to see. And if anyone find from any good source, can share in the group. You can see it later on. There is only uh, one topic, I uh, like hypernatremic dehydration, which is related. Yes, that is what I I told you. Yeah, in hypernatremic dehydration, you see, Doctor Rajda, uh, they they manage by breastfeeding. Hardly they manage by IV fluid in unit. Hardly because they say that breast milk will cover. Breast milk will cover like this. Mm, okay, yes. They are offering even NGT insertion as a rehydration rather than IV. Yes, they are offering insertion of NGT rather than IV in neonat. Yes, that is what I was telling. That I only remember this much. Okay, we we have to read this topic, and also some topic like cerebellitis. I would be very happy, or I'll be very grateful if someone among of us take the lead and they can guide this topic like neonatal dehydration, like one topic for one person. And another one like cerebellitis, another one like facial nerve palsy. I'll be very happy if you can announce in the group that I will do this topic to, to you. This will okay, be I will I will prepare this uh, uh, IV fluid topic in okay. units. You can look at that, and I will. Dr. Tahir can prepare us cerebellitis. Dr. Tahir, if you want, if you want, okay. There is no force, okay. Uh, so this by this we can know the real topic actually, real question. Uh, answer because we are now confused what to give what to and Dr. Wanzala is here he can prepare for Bell's palsy for us anyone for any topic okay 
Okay. And uh, okay, so this is abducens palsy. It is diagnosis abducens palsy. We yesterday we read six nerves, so lateral rectus palsy. And uh, bronchial asthma just came from ER nebulization, tachypnea, conscious child, SpO two ninety three. This question we discussed today. SpO two below ninety four, we have to give uh, oxygen. And uh, mild to moderate SpO two usually more than ninety two. Mild to moderate. Okay. Now next number three. Pass from the external auditory meters in child with otitis media for three days. Back now when the temperature thirty seven point four. So this is otitis media with pass coming. Okay. Here you will refer. Of course, definitely you have to refer to the ENT surgeon, and uh, there is you have to give antibiotic. Okay, otitis media and with uh, perforation of the membrane. What to do next? A list of antibiotic, IV, oral. I think IV is enough. IV, uh, sorry, oral is enough. Oral antibiotic, right? For perforation of the membrane, I have no idea. But oral, I, I will give oral amoxic level like this. And metronidazole because there is some pass for an aerobic infection. Urgent CT scan do nothing. No, no need of urgent CT scan in otitis media. I don't know of management of secretory otitis media. Any idea of ENT referral? Yes, of course, ENT referral is important because this is perforation. ENT surgeon will do the you know plasty or something. GBS diagnosis by we know by lumbar puncture and also by stool culture and also by um, in the nerve CDC, huh? nerve nerve. conduction. Yes, nerve conduction. Yeah. Stool culture. What is it that we would find in stool culture? Stool culture. Stool culture for Campylobacter jejuni, the cause of GBS. Okay. Okay. And nerve conduction. Yes, nerve conduction is there. Okay. Now next. Does MRI have a role in GBS? GBS MRI. No. If you suspect it is a case of transverse myelitis, then you have a role of MRI. Because there is a fusiform dilatation in the MRI for transverse myelitis, not for GBS. But NCV has role. Now, child with retching at the end, if the video X ray shows large coin. Retching, what do you mean by retching at the end if the video X ray shows large coin? Actually, this is actually they did laryngoscope uh, in this. So there is foreign body. Okay, this was the video. Foreign body management of foreign body. What is the management of foreign body? You have to refer ENT surgeon and you have to stabilize the patient. You have a breathing population. And there is maneuver now. Like what is that maneuver? Five back, back blow, and Heim Heimlich maneuver. Heimlich maneuver. Heimlich yes. maneuver. More than two years. We do this Board. Hamlet maneuver, then less than two years, uh, uh, five Modified. back to end, five chest thrust. Yes. Chest thrust. But, yes. Hamlet maneuver means abdominal thrust. This is for more than five years or more than two years. More than two years, abdominal thrust. And uh, less than two years, we give five back blow and five chest thrust. We don't do Hamlet maneuver for less than two years because there's a chance of rupture of the organs. But more than two years, we can do Hamlet maneuver. So... This is the primary management of him, foreign body. Then, if not removed, then airway breathing circulation. If the child is cyanosed or unconscious or not breathing, you have to give ABC. You have to chest compression, start chest compression and mouth to mouth breathing. What to do uh, between ENT and call general anesthesia? Achha, huh? What, whom you will call first? I will see if the child is well breathing, then I will call an ENT. If the child is not breathing, need intubation, I will call anesthesia. Now, TGA child with septo, septostomy, what is that? Oh, septostomy. Septostomy done, yeah. TGA septostomy done. SPO 289. What to do? Reassure. Septotomy. Yes. Septostomy. This is septostomy. Mane, you did actually puncture between right and left atria. Yeah. 
so this is it's 89 parents are anxious you have to reassure because this there will be mixing of blood into the right and left atria so the saturation will be low always now child with decay what cause of death said very dumb there was dehydration and shock but did not choose it it can be hypoglycemia it can be sepsis urgent ct scan do nothing yeah if it is cerebral edema you have to do urgent ct scan but but another point in a child who is dk how you do ct scan you cannot do ct scan child is very serious condition ct scan you have to stabilize the patient first okay i don't know the management of secretory arteritis media any idea of ent gbs okay this is the same Ah, uh, the large red swelling in the left side of the neck. Diagnosis is parotitis versus lymphadenitis. Okay, it can be infected branchial cyst also. It can be parotitis also. It can be um, sternocleidomastoid tumor also. Anything possible. Celiac disease diagnosis. TTG IgA IgA TTG right IgA TTG and total IgA level and orbital cellulitis CT scan must so these are the video topic okay this is the last page for tonight seventeen okay then after uh, this page there will be in nineteen 21 22 23 okay so five page will be rest we will do it tomorrow yeah, because i know when most of the people are tired okay so this is the last page of tonight mm -hmm. another exam about 2 year old child with distended tummy so wasted buttock celiac disease yes the only disease because in bangladesh if you see this disease or in Uh, our Asia country like India, Pakistan, we will say like this is malnutrition, mm, primary malnutrition, protein energy malnutrition. But in UK, they will say it's celiac disease. Then a kid of two to four year with limping gait. We have to remember that below three year, any child who is limping, this acute emergency, because this child may not be mal may may must be. Not malingering, so below three year any limping this is a red flag. And swollen one lower limb when the swelling is pressed the kid did not mind, so this is not septic arthritis. Show any sign of discomfort, so this is either cellulitis or osteomyelitis. So when a someone is compressing the joint swollen joint and the child did not mind, so I think this is. Um, Which variety? Osteomyelitis or cellulitis? This is not septic arthritis because septic arthritis is very painful. Okay. And cellulitis is also painful. It can. Cellulitis. It can be reactive. In reactive, there is swollen. Na joint is swollen. It can be reactive, right? And the child did not mind of compression, so it can be reactive arthritis. Okay. Most osteomyelitis, yes, osteomyelitis is chronic condition. It can present with swelling of the joint. Yeah, maybe possible. <laughs> What peculiar video <laughs> this is! <laughs> Now, three-year-old with antalgic gait. Mom concerned about limping gait for the last two months only. Option causes of limping gait. Two months child, uh, three-year-old child limping gait. Choose part this as a DDH would appear from the start. Yes, if it is only for two months, then this is not developmental dysplasia of youth. It uh, um, it can be part this because part this develop later on, so it can be part this. Another is it can be reactive arthritis, antalgic gait. It can be septic arthritis, anything antalgic gait, painful gait. But, but two months, I think two but months. But this is from the two yeah. months. Yes, these yeah, are the months. acute. Maybe J I A. This is two uh -huh. months. This is yes, you are right. Why not G I A? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
yes, septic will not be two months. Reactive will not be two months. So rule out. Yes, it is can be GIA, can be Parthis, both. Yes. Okay. But Parthis doesn't, does Parthis have antalgic gait? I am not sure. Parthis is non-painful, no? Avascular necrosis. Mm. Asha. Leukemia. But two months, no? Two month gate, leukemia, two month, unlikely. Yeah, and there is no rash. Yeah. No rash, nothing. Only dalgic gate. Yes, parthis can be. I, I agree. Parthis may be painful, may be painless. And also another one is GIA. These two are most common degree in this case. Number four. Patient with status epilepticus given lorazepam. Okay. And is being bagged as preparation for intubation. What is the next step? His tummy look distended. Makes sense to insert NGT. I choose 20 ml of normal saline. Status epilepticus, lorazepam was given. And there was a preparation of intubation. And the child look, tummy look distended. Uh, NGT. We'll put NGT. We'll, what is that scenario? I am confused. <laughs> what is this scenario? It's just okay. a scenario on the, um, you know, the guideline management of status epilepticus. The next yeah. step, if one step fails, what do you do next? I think that's, I don't think normal saline plays any role here. Yeah. Tummy distended means there is a gas. No, so it may be, go. yeah, it may be tummy is distended, you're bagging. So you're pumping air into the stomach. So you just need to pass an NG tube to deflate. Yes, I agree. But why 20 ml if the child is not in shock? Why 20 ml? We'll that was what the person chose. No, why, that why doesn't bagging? necessarily mean it's correct. Why, yeah. why bagging? What does it mean, bag, bagged? What does that mean? The, the child is um, unconscious. Humble bag. Oh, um, humble bagging. The child is unconscious. Okay. So why why would you do um bagging in unconscious child with It may be from an ambulance. You don't know where this scenario took place started from. So it may be they're bringing a child to the hospital. They hadn't intubated. I don't know. I'm just we are just reasoning it out. Yeah. Chattas epilepticus uh, may be due to respiratory arrest. So they are doing bagging, bag masks, and then they will do intubation. Okay, this we can understand. So that's why that's why he op that's why he opted for saline push. Because if it's uh, he's bagging, it means he's going into shock. Maybe that's why. Okay, status epilepticus can present is at as anything shock, respiratory failure can present as anything. So, what money they are doing everything, and the, in the video you see they are doing such certain procedure, and after that the examiner will ask what is the next step. So you see. You see that the child is begging and prepared for intubation, so no need. There is two options needed, NG tube or normal saline. Which one is important? Now, tummy was distended, so may, maybe he need NGT. And if the child is in shock, maybe he need 20 ml normal saline. So there is two options. In the video, you have to look carefully. Is it the NGT first step or normal saline first step? But in my 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 understanding we do airway breathing circulation so first we secure airway then we do breathing then circulation so we need to give normal saline first because ngt you can put later on there is no hurry of putting ngt am i correct if we manage like abc because it is a status epilepticus right so if we manage like abc then we will put airway breathing circulation like this. Dr. Tamana, excuse me, this uh, respiratory depression could be secondary to low resipum? Yes, that's why they are giving, you know, bagging mass, bag mass, and they are giving intubation. But but what is the next management? Insert NGT or 20 ml normal cell line? Right. Due to this uh, distended tummy, no? again, the respirator may be compromised. So do, first to decompress, I think. Okay, but but before securing the circulation, do you need decompress first mm. before circulation? I think that is the priority. Mm -hmm. Yes, because you're splinting the diaphragm. The tummy is so distended with gas. Mm. 
you need to mm. um def- dis- um sorry pass mm. the ng and let mm. that gas leave and that will help you with your because now we've not even started out the breeding the airway probably may be secure the breeding is still an issue so you can't leave breeding and go to c you have to complete the b before you move to c oh, yes you have a point yes very good what's your name doctor you have uh, how i made pro <laughs> It's, it's you are. Yeah, yeah. It's you are. Why you double your A? Yeah. Okay. Okay. You are from Malaysia. No, I'm from the UK. UK. Okay. Mm. So, uh, yes, your point is very valid. You cannot complete B, and then you have to go C. So this uh, distended tummy actually interrupting the uh, diaphragm movement. Actually, that's why you have to complete the B. An NGT. putting of the ngt is not so much time consuming i think actually they are doing side by side one person is doing ngt and another person is putting iv cannula i know this is because this is the emergency situation so yeah so you have to answer this question very very i mean very very cleverly very in a cool brain because what is the priority breathing then certainly can What will be the correct answer? Anyone have a UK or what? <laughs> I think that's it. You did not listen. <laughs> NGT, NGT. No, I listen. NGT. Now, a fair boy. In poverty nature, it's nothing but a poor color of pulsey. There was a reddish cheek and face generally. what is the initial investigation making sense answer is ct scan brain versus mri audio uh, auditory meatus pair baby uh, there is lower motor neuron palsy reddish rash ah so this is same viral fever with rash with uh, lower motor facial palsy now what is this today we discuss it can be live or it can be any virus 13 years it can be any virus. Yes, thirteen years. It can be parvo, Epstein Barr, because any virus can affect actually facial nerve. Okay, mm. because there is reddish cheek, so this cannot be like uh, varicella. This cannot be Ramsey hand. If it is unilateral dermatomal distribution, then we can say this is Ramsey hand. So what will we do in this case? nothing it is lower motor neuron type of facial palsy it is kind of brain why why because is this varicella you think or what why is it is no i think to find out if there is a um, any special combined lesion that will cause upper motor neuron lesion especially occupying lesion uh-huh. no they say na no, lower motor neuron palsy mm mm okay So to my opinion there is no investigation required but because this is viral this question is coming many time okay so guys uh, any one of you have any idea of this question i think we should also prepare this topic as well mm-hmm. all this, the, in uh, all the aspects this fish bells policy with rashes policy with rashes yes okay if no one is yeah, ready, uh, hello Yes. Yes, yeah, Dr. Tamana. I think here uh, they want to just watch the uh, auditory meatus, where which is not sometimes not visible from outside. That's why they are intending to do CT scan or MRI. And the lower motor it starts from pons beyond that. So in lower mm. motor doesn't mean this should be in the uh, means beyond the brain. It is below the pons, but which is not visible. That's why they want to see the auditory meatus. Okay, then MRI because is because it, it it yes, it is a long course over there, no? Since spawns mm. to come to the uh, superficial parts, mm. so yes, they actually want to know the cause because there are reddish cheek, but lower motor facial palsy. What is the cause? Is there any as Dr. Ilhama said, any space occupying lesion in the pons, maybe, or in the pathway auditory meatus? There may be that tumor, no? What is that called? Uh, in the acoustic tumor, acoustic tumor. Tumor in the yes. internal, internal auditory meatus. EBV, 
Doctor, Doctor Tamanna, why can't it be mums? Mums. But they did not say here is swelling, swelling of the parotid gland. They said only red color cheek. Yeah, so uh, it's, I mean, uh, it's a thing, uh, but I think it can be in the differentials. It can be parvovirus, ma, slap cheek. And they cause lower motor? They cause lower motor, yes. Any virus can cause lower motor. Okay, so this we have to prepare. This is very confusing question, okay? Uh, yeah. Excuse me, there is a, uh, there is a uh, thing that a high resolution MRI is done mainly to detect the bony anomalies, aneurysms, mm -hmm. and brain infiltrative tumors mm -hmm. in case of Bell's palsy. So okay. this is the main indication of doing high resolution MRI. MRI. And we don't do CT scan for posterior fossa. You see the posterior fossa uh, below the, uh, that is called infra, what is that? Infra tentorial. Infra tentorial, everything we have to see MRI. Supra tentorial, CT scan. Supra tentorial, MRI. So we should do MRI to check any abnormalities there. Also, auditory meatus. Actually, the course of the facial nerve. Facial nerve, yes, 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 definitely. To see the course of the facial nerve. Yes, yes because the lower motor is started from the pons. It's a long way in the uh, in between that it comes to the superficial, to the parotid gland and to the pons. Yes. And we have to read this topic, rash with facial palsy. This is very, very common. I Please, I request anyone come forward and prepare this topic for us. Nothing. You should not prepare for slide. You write down on hand, handwriting, and then click the picture. And then we will show it in the uh, Zoom. So we will uh, do this meeting, like uh, neonatal IV fluid for dehydration, then Bell's palsy with this virus, then another is cerebellitis. That is also a very common topic for our exam. And it, any of this, you know, when I was in part one student, I used to tell in the meeting that please solve this question. This will come. Please solve this question. And that comes in exam. And then everyone said, oh, Tamanna, you said this question will come. We did not solve. So my intuition is very clear, OK? So anyone, please prepare this topic and tell us. We will arrange a meeting for these topics, these three, four high yield topics, OK? Now, uh, six to eight months old with noisy breathing, mostly laryngomalacia. And uh, option include group, quanalatresia. OK, quanalatresia does cause noisy breathing, yes. They can cause noisy breathing. Hmm. But group can cause barking like bracy cough. Right? Okay. Yeah, but, but quantum so treasure can... in, in an eight month old is, is, um, is very you unlikely. Mean? Unilateral, unilateral may present Unless late. Unilateral. Unilateral. Yes. So this can be unilateral quantum atresia or group. There was noisy breathing. The video was like this a child, eight month old, he is breathing but noisy and you have to say the differential diagnosis and this video i'm telling you in uk exam this is very common i saw many past test videos and there are a lot of breathing sound they are very fond of this breathing sound okay so this eight month old with noisy breathing can be unilateral quantal atresia can be proof we have to remember it can be many dd like you know uh, like epiglottitis like by uh, trachitis, like post pharyngeal abscess, but the, in those cases, child will be very toxic, febrile, very toxic child. But if the child is happy, playful, then it is either quantal atresia unilateral or group. Next, baby received MMR vaccine before one month, came with erythematous rash. What to do? Baby received MMR vaccine before one month, came with rash. Uh, yes, even after MMR vaccine, they can develop uh, rubella. Yeah, this is very common. So this is reassurance, nothing to do. Teenage girl with chorea and thyroid eye. Chorea, no, this is tremor. Okay, tremor and exophthalmos and very minimum bulging of the neck, money, thyroid swelling. So what is the next investigation? Thyroid function test. We read today hyperthyroid which comes with tremor and exophthalmos and goiter. 
child with tracheostomy well cared still has difficulty of breathing he has facial huge hemangioma which looks infected or burn what to do this is infected hemangioma option is steroid inhaler antibiotic antiviral cpap now this case hemangioma with tracheostomy i need i think there is a internal hemangioma in the trachea okay and there is respiratory difficulty so you have to give what i think cpap or something intubation but difficult intubation this is because it hemangioma can be injured and bleeding okay so what will be the answer here we will refer this case definitely to the ent surgeon is already having tracheostomy so just respiratory support he can yeah so uh, yeah we need respiratory support yeah and we can give a propanolol no we can give propanolol and for this infected hemangioma you have to give antibiotic it is i know infected hemangioma but what about the breathing see this case is <laughs> very very tough this case's answer is very tough mm. so with tracheostomy he is still having breathing difficulty so for breathing difficulty we will give some respiratory support out of this only cpap is written so yeah on the only cpap yeah only cpap is the last option here yeah and we can choose two options cpap and antibiotic two option mm. okay so child with shingle what is the treatment option is oral acyclovir iv acyclovir antibiotic steroid now oral uh, dr tamang i'm sorry to interrupt you this the ninth one uh, can't it be cardiac failure secondary to huge hemangioma not improving with even tracheostomy can be and then what about this one facial hemangioma look like infected or burn what is that management but if, if we're thinking heart failure due to which is viable due to a large um due to a large hemangioma there's no option that would fit that or mm. or yeah yeah if if these options then think of sepsis mm -hmm. um <clears throat> but even in sepsis you have to give breathing support even if it is sepsis you have to give support but support is already given in the form of tracheostomy so i think antibiotics will be good good choice mm. stuff actually i i i surrender <laughs> this type of video if comes in exam <laughs> i will say i surrender <laughs> despite treatment tummy is still child has difficult breathing ha uh ha -huh. put some light like Hmm. light <laughs> what is this okay next child is shingle what is the treatment this is easy child is shingle we give iv or oral acyclovir shingle we just read that shingle you have to treat vigorously because otherwise there will be permanent damage of the nerve facial nerve okay and there will be permanent damage of the cordal tympani branch oh sorry the nerve to the trapezius vision hearing loss so i think we should give iv right or oral acyclovir in shingle no one has oral, oral dr tamanna i am it's oral shingle okay herpes simplex yeah, i think it's oral unless the child is immunocompromised or the, the very small children uh, units shingles yeah very small we don't give iv shingles treatment treatment guideline in shingles only do two things give antiviral and uh, protect from pain 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 killer yes management of shingles okay let us read nhs but in adults uh, one of my brother he got shingles so they gave him steroids i don't know why okay mhm mm this is very interesting steroid for shingles yeah they give it this thing you know facial nerve palsy they give steroid okay this is nhs guideline okay england uh, shingle 
also known as herpes zoster okay incidence one in four people will develop shingle during their lifetime so how many people are affected with chicken pox one in four they will develop shingle in their lifetime so this is very common and older individual are more likely to develop complication like neuralgia post herpetic neuralgia common symptom is pain and paresthesia and uh, post herpetic neuralgia is also occur then uh, is shingle contagious it is not possible to catch shingle directly from someone okay and what is ophthalmic shingle if it occurs in the ophthalmic nerve then it is called ophthalmic shingle and uh, is there any cure there is no cure for shingle only painkiller you will give for four week and uh, shingle vaccination there is just a vax in the uk used for shingle vaccine my god it is just a vax okay mm -hmm. and um, okay this vaccine only given above 70 years so we are spared okay just a vaccine only after 70 years but here nothing written like you know this care of they did not write here anything about I am reading from the patient.info. So they have written this antiviral medication if started within 72 hours of rash. Mm -hmm. And there are specific conditions for this antiviral and they have not mentioned whether to give it by oral or IV route. Okay, so we will go by our own guideline that if the patient is severely immunocompromised, neonate, cannot take orally or if febrile, we will give IV. If the patient can take orally, we will give oral. Because somewhere I, I read that oral and IV acyclovir has similar action. The action is not different. Okay. Pain, for rash. for hmm. steroids, they have written, uh, they help to reduce the inflammation. So short course of steroid tablet can be used short in course. addition to antiviral. Yes, five days. Okay. Yes, sure. So here in this website, they said, shingle is very common, okay? Not so uncommon. Painkiller, as Dr. Tahir said, tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline, not triptyline, we can give. And especially in post herpetic neuralgia. Or if there is no post herpetic neuralgia, we can give paracetamol, ibuprofen, or oxycodone, tramadol. We can give manomorphine. We can give. If uh, post herpetic neuralgia, best treatment is tricyclic antidepressant and gabapentin or pre gabalin any anticonvulsant medication, their nerve stabilizer, they actually control the convulsion and nerve. Okay, and antiviral medication, acyclovir, again, velocyclovir, we can give. Yes, we can give. Uh, any antiviral medication is uh, useful if it is given below 72 hours. Yes, below 72 hours. Or if the shingle affected the eye, very important, you should give uh, as cyclovir because if it is affected eye and yeah steroid you can use steroid tablet may be considered in addition of antiviral because anti-inflammatory yes but steroid use is controversial your doctors will advise and steroid do not prevent poor her post herpetic neuralgia it do not prevent Tests are not usually done. So there is no investigation required because it is reactivation. And if you have poor immune system, you should, you must check your doctor because poor immune system is a, a, a side, actually very dangerous condition. They will give high dose of steroid if it is post immunocompromised patient. Mm -hmm. It's very dangerous, okay? And HIV immunocompromised bone marrow transplant. This patient, if develop shingle, this is very dangerous. Okay. Okay, guys. So I think we learned enough today. And inshallah, I will finish this folder tomorrow. Only five pages remaining.
tomorrow morning okay maybe i am free i will arrange meeting for tomorrow okay any question any suggestion and if anyone interested to do to do that confusing topics please come forward message me in the whatsapp i will arrange a meeting for all of us okay we can discuss there is no uh, pressure but if you can do it will be helpful for you also because when i prepare some presentation now that time i am i am most benefited i know that's why okay thank you dr uh, tahir and dr rajda dr ilhama and dr vihana thank you dr uh, vanzala thank you everyone okay rest i don't know the name so thank you everyone see you inshallah uh, for next